Welcome back. We're going to continue our journey of getting to know the Cappadocian women, and I hope that you're enjoying getting to know them. Today, we're going to look at two women who provide an example for us of understanding regarding temperance. Now, let me just tell you who the two of them are. It's Amelia, or Saint Emily, as she is known, and Macrina the Younger. This is a mother and a daughter. Let me start by telling you about Amelia. You learned about her mother-in-law the last time that we got together, her mother-in-law, Macrina the Elder. This young lady, Amelia, we read that she was a very beautiful young lady. She had lost both of her parents during the persecution, so she was an orphan. She was in this world where here she was, this beautiful young girl that was an orphan, and many men were after her. Macrina, the elder, the woman that we talked about that had courage, she had the courage to reach out to this young lady and to arrange for her to be married to her son, in a way protecting her from the world that wanted to get at her and giving her a new life. And I believe that Emily always was grateful and appreciative for the way that she was saved from the world in which she had found herself. Here, there, there she had been, she had been this orphan, and now suddenly she is the wife of a man who has inherited a great deal of wealth. Eventually, she becomes a woman that cares for a large household. She becomes a mother with 10 children. We believe that one of those passed away, but nine of them um, eventually getting to adulthood. Interestingly, of all of her children, let me just give you this little side note over here. Her daughter, Macrina, her son, Basil, her son, Gregory, her son, Peter, and her son, Necratius, all become saints in the church. We don't know that we have on record any other mother who has five children who become canonized as saints within the life of the church. So let me just tell you, St. Emily, an incredible mother who poured into the life of her children. Now, the daughter that we want to talk about in this session is the oldest daughter. Her name is Macrina. She's the one who bears the secret name of Thecla. And Macrina, the daughter, again, we're told, was extremely beautiful. And when she was of age to be married, the family arranged for her to marry a young man. He was a lawyer. He was presumably older than she was. And before they can actually be married, he dies. And in that moment, she discovers that she does not feel that she is supposed to ever get married again. She says to them, I'm going to live as if I am a widow. And she says, I want to give all of my life in service and in consecration to God. The family's really concerned about her. How is she going to survive? What's she going to do? But do you see the parallels here between her and Thecla, the one that we learned about? So Macrina, the younger, at this point in time, ends up becoming the spiritual leader of the whole family. And I think this is really fascinating because she goes on to have these brothers that are priests and, and the bishop. And yet, at the end of the day, her brother Gregory of Nyssa calls her the teacher. As a matter of fact, Peter, her younger brother, talks about how everything that he learns about the Bible and everything, it's the sister Macrina that becomes the teacher in the home that teaches the younger siblings everything that they can about this, the word of God. They said she'd go to bed at night holding the Psalms under her arm. I mean, this woman loved and studied everything that she could study. But there came this turning point after she did not get married where she began to talk to her mom and say, Mom, I think God is leading us to a different kind of life. A life of self-sacrifice, a life of self-discipline, a life in which I don't need all of these worldly goods. And so both Macrina and her mother, helping to lead the family, help the family to divest of many of their earthly goods, they go from living in the big city of Caesarea out to a plot of land that the family had had back up there where grandma had lived. And they begin to live out in the country and they take all the people that had been servants with them, but they put them all on equal ground. Everybody is free. And everybody within this community, it will be a community of faith. And literally it becomes the first monastery run by a woman that we know of in the whole world. 
Macrina begins to establish what this community is going to look like, and eventually her little brother Peter grows up enough that he runs the men's side, she runs the women, but she's actually the one on top of the whole place. She runs the whole facility. She talks her mom into living a simple lifestyle. They end up living together with their servants. It talks about how Macrina would make the bread alongside everybody else in the kitchen. And there they sought the face of God. There we understand that Macrina herself was continually transformed into becoming somebody that was more and more like Jesus. The stories tell us of all the people from all around the surrounding land that would come to that place. They would bring their children that needed to be healed. They would come for their own touch, for their own healing. And when Macrina eventually dies, all of the priests and the bishops from the entire area come for her funeral because she had become the spiritual mother of an entire part of the country. Huh. Temperance. You see, they were willing to give things up for the sake of others. And I think sometimes we don't like these words. We don't like talking about temperance. I mean, for us, that conversation around temperance, I think back to my grandmother, who was part of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. It was about abstinence of alcohol for the sake of others. Do we want to talk about those kind of things? Do we want to talk about that that might be a virtue in the Christian life? That maybe I have to give something up for the sake of someone else? That maybe I need to live a life of self-discipline? That conversation can go into many different areas. It has to do with how we shop even responsibly. Now, maybe I'm getting into some touchy areas, but think about this. What is it about what I consume and about what I do that may actually affect somebody else's life in somewhere other part of the world? The call to follow Jesus. Temperance is a virtue. Temperance is a virtue of Jesus Christ. So the question for us today is, what will it take for us to consider what temperance means for me in my life? so that I can become more like him.